he seems a very gregarious person, but I don't think he is. He finds people quite a struggle, and therefore, by coming here and having, um, having animals to work with, they give him a sort of structure to the day. Um, but he doesn't have to talk to them. He can be out Maybe there feeding yeah. the horses or riding the horses or whatever he's doing. And, um, but he doesn't have to think about them particularly unless they're sick or something. Whereas if there's people around, if he had the same number of people as he has horses here all the time, he'd have to be considering them and talking to them, thinking about them, which um, probably wouldn't suit him nearly as well. And I often think of Philip's painting as a process in which he goes into his studio and turns out the pockets of his mind. The accumulation of that fluff and dirt and scraps of paper that you find in your pockets and lays them out before him and suddenly something will assume significance it may be the corner of a spade, it may be the eye of a horse, the particular way in which a horse carries its head. Something entirely trivial. And it was, I suspect, an attitude towards painting which developed for Philip in the late 70s, when He'd recently come back from Spain, and it's not so much that, as they say, travel broadens the mind, travel fills the pockets of the mind. And it's as if I thought that Philip, some months or some years after he'd come back from Spain, kept finding these little scraps of paper, which, as he unfolded them, suddenly unfolded the life that he'd been living in Spain. And since that time, every new move that Philip's made has something to do with the way in which he, he lives his life. It doesn't matter where he happens to be or what it is that he happens to be doing. It's a peculiar way he has of noticing the unnoticed, of vi vivifying the ordinary, somehow making the unnoticed noticed, and making us notice the unnoticed. How could there be something depressing about a painting which just gave the feel of what it was like to live? And that's why I think so many of his paintings are benign. The paintings are just sort of a product of that lifestyle, of all my lifestyle, because I don't think verbally I have much to say on painting and I think on the whole that it, what Lee and, and Peter say sum it up pretty well on a par actually because the painter doesn't talk about art no, this is it. you know he paints it occasionally I can help by being the first person on the scene when he's done a painting perhaps he's worried about it he's not it's not quite right and he's not quite sure why it's not quite right and sometimes I'm able to look at that painting and say one area of it seems out of out of line that he should perhaps try what say he tries a different yellow or something like that so that's rare um, in that way I have a direct influence I suppose on the finished product um, apart from that. What was your question? And this is the one with um, I used with manure, uh, manure and sawdust. sawdust yeah. It gives a lovely, um, lovely feel to the work, actually. This one. Well, I mean, this, this, this sort of texture, this encrustation that you're getting in the in the painting, since you, you went to that powdered paint, yeah. is a lovely. Helps lovely a bit. Yeah. Right. But I mean, um, how, how stable is this going to be? It's okay, pretty good. Bad, not bad. This isn't as good as the later ones because I've worked out the technique a bit better. But uh, that'll be right. I don't, I don't worry too much about it because they're, you know, I don't think of selling them at all. 
when you paint them, you know. So look, I don't think makes the distinction between his painting and his life. There's never anything threatening or depressing in Philip's painting, because in the end, how could there be something depressing about a life that was being lived? I don't think I've influenced him at all. I don't, I don't know, of course. Other people would probably see the influences. He certainly used, he, he's used me, he uses everything that's grist to the mill um, as subject matter. But I don't know that I'd call that influencing. It's, um, he's, he's painted my work tables. Um, he made some super paintings. Best, well, some of the best ones I think he's ever done were of garments that Martin and I paint, uh, printed together. And um, Philip turned those into great big canvases, which he turned into, um, he made in the form of Vogue patterns which I was using at that stage before we were drafting our own. And he made them in envelopes full of rubbish, actually, screwed up bits of pattern and so on and so on. And, um, but he used our prints and he cut himself wood blocks the way we were doing. So I suppose that was a fairly, that's perhaps the most direct influence. As far as um, actually influencing what he paints myself, well, I don't really consider that I do that. Coming to terms with Philip's paintings is, as I say, very much like coming to terms with the, the person themselves. Which is not to say that you need to know Philip personally, I mean as I do, to know him as a friend, even to know anything about him. What's important is to be able to approach a painting as if it were the face of a mind, of a human mind, and to begin to follow the contours of the human mind. What does a Philip Tristram painting mean? It's the kind of tedious question that critics often get asked. For me, I guess, a painting is like a person. I think of its meaning as being Philip Tristram, as being a... <laughs> I was just talking about what it's like to be Philip Trustum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All the way from the Eden. Tell me about the horses now. Right. I don't want to see any more of your art. I want, no, to, right. I want to know uh, about the art of George. horses. This is George, the boss. George. The boss. And then Johnny, the one I ride. John Steed, teenage John Steed. And nice fella. Ooh. Yeah, a little bit nervous around the heady area, aren't you, George? Yes, he th thinks you're playing. Just to state, see, Ooh. he wants a game, see, <laughs> see, just a game, he wants a game, see, you know, you back off, that's all, see, you sometimes you don't have it, just, see, you want to bite my you know, you shouldn't do this. God, he's such a lovely horse. Good boy. Yes, he wants a game and the other horse won't play him because he's the boss. It's sort of like me walking up to Tyson and saying, here's a game. <laughs> that's right. All right. I think we're supposed to be walking up this way. Right. All right.